Shalom, shalom, friends. And it's wonderful to see you here at session two of the 10 Greatest Jewish Ideas. Uh, excited to learn with you, uh, to share some ideas and then hear your thoughts via chat or um, by unmuting. And looking forward to that. Before we jump into topic two, I want to invite you to cast a vote, uh, the most important vote you're going to cast all day today um, on, on this poll question here. <laughs> On repair, everything and everyone can be repaired, option one. Option two, some things and people are permanently broken, option three. Some things can be permanently broken, but people cannot be. Which of those most aligns with your view, even if not perfectly? Okay, an even spread here. 45% say everything and everyone can be repaired. 18% say some things and people are permanently broken. And 36% say some things can be permanently broken, but, but people cannot be. All right, very interesting. It's worth thinking about how you voted and where that comes from in your experience and in your ideology and how that continues to play out for you. So friends, today is the idea of repair is possible. There's a story told of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the father of the 19th century Musar movement, that while staying at the home of an elderly shoemaker, Rabbi Salanter no noticed the man mending shoes late into the night. The older man was hunched over his work, despite the fact that his candle, the sole source of light, was almost completely burnt out. Rabbi Salanter asked the shoemaker why he was still working when it was so late and the candle light was nearly gone. The shoemaker replied, as long as the candle is still burning, it is still possible to make repairs. Rabbi Salanter was struck by this notion and its more spiritual implications. It said that for weeks afterward, he would be heard repeating this sentence over and over. As long as the candle is burning, it is still possible to make repairs. As long as we have the life left in us, there is still time to repair what is broken. The possibility of repair is one of the great Jewish ideas. When I refer to repair, I'm thinking both of tikkun, which is the concept of repairing a broken world, tikkun olam, or a broken home, tikkun bait, or a broken self, tikkun atzmi, or a broken nation, tikkun medina, and in addition to the concept of tikkun, the concept of teshuva, which is the concept of making amends in our relationships. The alternative to believing in repair is, of course, the idea of irredeemability. If we hurt people, we are condemned as a bad person because we live in a broken world. There is no hope of change. But as Jews, we are given a wealth of traditions and practices that hinge on the human capacity for repair. I'm going to start on the level of the individual by addressing interpersonal repair and then expand to the concept of societal repair. Judaism teaches us that when there has been hurt or damage in a personal relationship, it's up to us to fix it. While other religions might offer the wrongdoer the possibility of absolution through confession to God, Judaism doesn't have an out like this. The Talmud is clear. Even on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, God cannot forgive us for transgressions against other people until we have done the work to repair or to appease the person we've wronged, says in Yoma 85b, is how the Talmud puts it over there. Process of doing teshuva, making amends, and repairing our relationships is absolutely fundamental to a Jewish approach to living. We all make mistakes. We all speak without thinking. We all act selfishly. We fail to consider someone else's feelings. We traffic in the ignorance we were raised in. So what do we do when we have 
treated someone in a hurtful way and want to make amends? Well, in rabbinic sources, there are so many robust writings on how we should go about doing teshuva when we've wronged someone. This process of repair is elegantly distilled by the 12th century scholar, the Rambam Maimonides, in his work, the Mishnah Torah. According to him, there's four indispensable steps of teshuva. First, we must acknowledge our wrongdoing to the person we wronged. That means there can be no accountability without admitting that we messed up. It may be tempting to rush over such an uncomfortable step, but acknowledging the damage we have caused in the, is the first step in repairing that damage, to truly sit with it, to truly acknowledge what has happened here, directly or indirectly. Number two, expressing a sincere remorse. I think the operative word here is sincere. Um, to truly express remorse, we must be able to access a vulnerable part of ourselves and offer that part of ourselves to the person we're apologizing to. Number three, we must do all in our power to right the wrong in the eyes of the person we wrong. This, of course, is a critical step and one that's often skipped in modern discussions of making amends. Repair does not end with an apology. In fact, you could say it begins with one. Instead, repair is a collaborative effort in which the one who was harmed has the right to feel in some way soothed. The deepest experience I've had with this, as I've reflected on before, was last high holiday spending time with people in recovery. And these people in recovery making amends are not are going back to people in the depths of their addiction, in the depths of their criminal life, and are not just being like, hey, I know I, you know, lit your house on fire or broke your mailbox or stole your, your necklace or whatever, right? Or like destroyed your marriage, like whatever I did. And I'm, I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like I sincerely apologize. Like going so far to correct things actually find some way to make them better. I've never seen anything like it than I saw with these people in recovery and how far they were going uh, to try to fix that. Number four, we must commit to act differently in the future. The true measure of teshuva is its transformative power. How can the experience of offering accountability, remorse, and amends change us? How will we act differently in the future? This step in the process also helps the wronged party feel comfortable in recommitting to the damaged relationship. Friends, this is a great time of year to think about this, because normally we wait till Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur to think about this stuff, and we're about halfway there. So it's a great time when we're not thinking about this. We're thinking about Pesach recipes to actually pause and think about um, such, transform, tra such, such transformation. That our sacred Jewish texts take the time to outline a step-by-step -step process of teshuva is a beautiful reminder that repair is possible, perhaps in all ways. And what is repair but a belief in the possibility of change? We all have the potential to change and grow. It's tempting to take a fixed approach to our relationships, to imagine that if someone has hurt our feelings, they will always hurt our feelings, to imagine that if a relationship feels strained, there is no hope for it. However, even in relationships where there's an estrangement and a pain, the possibility remains that not only can the other person change, but the, rela the relationship itself can. Much like the candle in the story of the shoemaker, the Talmud consistently teaches us that teshuva is possible. In Exodus Rabbah, Shmot Rabbah, we learn the gates of teshuva are always open and anyone who wishes to enter may enter. Elsewhere, teshuva is likened to the sea, while prayer is likened to a mikvah. Just like a mikvah that is only open for certain hours, we have set time for liturgy, meaning we cannot pray shacharit in the evening. You can't pray the morning prayers at night. But like the sea, which is always open and never closes, the gates of teshuva are always open. There's no right or wrong time to make teshuva. Our traditions around repair are so powerful because they see the relationship between two people as an entity in its own right, something precious worth saving. It's notable that when one person makes teshuva for a wrongdoing, they are not only they're not the only one with responsibilities. The rabbis teach us that when we are wronged, we should be open to the possibility of accepting amends and offering forgiveness.
The Rambam tells us that when, a, when one who has wrong does meaningful teshuva, we should pardon wholeheartedly if we are able to do so. Not always easy. When it comes to family fallout, it's increasingly common for people to choose to walk away from their biological family. There's data that suggests that up to one in four people are estranged from at least one family member. That's a 25% of the population in America. And we've all heard the verified statistic that about 50% of new marriages end in divorce. More than 50%. So often that we treat our relationships as expendable. Now, I want to be clear here that I'm not advocating, of course, for people to stay in abusive relationships. In many, in many cases, divorce and family estrangement are completely justified and necessary. Nor am I advocating for reconciling with individuals who are deeply dangerous to a victim's physical and emotional health and safety. There are and have always been legitimate reasons for cutting people off, cutting people out of our lives, as each of us has the right to a healthy and safe space in our lives. What I do want to question, however, is the mentality that one, it is not ever worth it to do the work of repair, and two, there is no way for someone to make amends to us after they've wronged us, even wronged us deeply. What the Rambam is offering is the mentality that there's a real value in engaging in teshuva for both parties, the victim and the perpetrator. Our default ought not to be to discard one another. We live in a society of discarding. Part of the problem is how capitalism has trained us to think about value. Because of production and overproduction, we're used to discarding what no longer works for us and what we no longer need. Like, I just don't like this shirt anymore. Gone. Many products are actually developed with planned obsolescence in mind, meaning they're designed to be discarded and to be replaced right? That the iPhone might only last you two years intentionally. This capitalistic ethos of consumerism has carried over into our personal relationships. And too often we think of the people in our lives as simply expendable, not worthy of investment. I'll just, um, you know, leave any job the moment I have a better offer. I'll leave any relationship as soon as something becomes more fun. I'm just living in a world of discarding. But we and our relationships are worthy of tshuva. In our society, there are so many prevailing ideologies that reject the concept of repair. Take, for example, the American approach to criminal justice, which is so often premised on the belief that people are not redeemable. The numbers are consistently shocking. In a country with a population of over 300 million, the United States is currently incarcerating nearly 2 million people by way of federal and state prisons and jails juvenile correctional facilities, and immigration detention facilities. We do not have a system that invests in the learning or rehabilitation of the incarcerated. For example, while in the general American population, only 18% of people do not have a high school diploma, approximately 41% of incarcerated individuals do not have a high school diploma. If we began to shift our ideology toward a belief in repair, we might begin to imagine a criminal justice system that believes in the potential for growth and healing. Of course, I'm not advocating for a system that ignores the needs of public safety or the rights of the victims. Rather, I'm thinking about a world where every human being is considered redeemable. By the way, this, this, this room we're looking at here with these bunk beds, I have a colleague who recently shared with me that during um, one of his experiences of incarceration, there were actually 300 beds in, in that room that were always full. And as opposed to this being a, a, a double-decker bu bunk bed, is that what you call it? What do you call it when it's two levels? They were three levels. So there were 100 three-level beds, the inevitability of the fighting. And, and interesting enough, um, you can see the racial, um, the racial lines right there. You can see the three here to the right um, that appear to be you know, more of a... Um, Hispanic background, and then you see two two black men there to the left, plus the ones across from them. And this is not a fairy tale. I mean, this is the reality of incarceration, of how things get divided. And some people are biracial and oftentimes get pitted up against a group, which they're half of, um, simply because they appear one way or another and are forced into that group. Dynamics are uh, quite complex. And, but it was also, you know, it's also worth noting that sometimes it's believed that the, um, the guards actually allow the fighting and the brutality. And there are some rare cases of that. More commonly, 
it's been shown that there's simply oversights. There's places the cameras can't see. There's places such as uh, showers and other spaces where the brutalities happen in there, um, you know, beyond the sight of guards and cameras. Anyways, that's a whole other conversation. It's worth noting that when I refer to tshuva as a category of repair, I'm not using the most common translation. Many people translate teshuva as repentance. However, there is such a heaviness to that word. In English, repent can, me can mean simply to feel regret or, con or contrition. That fails to capture the essence that teshuva has of making things right, of restoring a relationship between two people. Literally, teshuva means to return. Broadly, it refers to returning to the path of righteousness, the path of purity of the soul, meaning a return to God, a return to one's baby-like state, one's kind of essence of, of innocence to innocence, one's return to one's best self. The more expected Hebrew word for repair would be tikkun, which is familiar to the most liberal Jews in the context of tikkun olam, the Jewish value of repairing the world. Unlike teshuva, you won't find evidence for tikkun olam in the Bible. We, see, we first see it in the Talmud, over there in the mission of Gittin, where the rabbis talk about actions, mipne tikkun ha'olam, for the betterment of the world. The concept of tikkun olam, as most of us know it, emerges from medieval Jewish mysticism, namely that of Rabbi Isaac Luria of Sfat, also known as the Ari of the 16th century. In very brief version, Lurianic Kabbalah teaches that the holy light of God was sent to earth vessels, which, unable to hold the divine light, broke. They broke, but not permanently. Thus, instead of a perfect world, we have a world of brokenness. Here is where our role comes in as humans. When the vessels broke, sparks of divine light shattered everywhere. Right? We started talking about this last week. It's the work of us on earth to gather these sparks and repair what has been broken. We do this through mitzvot, right, the commandments, tzedakah, um, financial justice, and gimilut chasadim, acts of loving kindness, right? And this is where we see an intersection of our first idea of last week, that everything matters, and our idea today, that repair everywhere is potentially possible. The appeal and relevance of this approach to the world is only too evident. That we live in a broken world is undeniable. On the level of justice, climate, human rights, and beyond, we can all agree that we are in a world filled with suffering and loss. Here, I think the Jewish concept of repair is instructive in that it hopefully helps us guide away from black and white thinking, either that the world is, is, is perfect and good or that the world is irredeemably broken. Someone might look at our world and say, Ugh, this broken society, it's beyond help, right? It's just done. They might say, we are condemned. Clearly, there is no point in working to improve conditions because we'll never achieve a utopic version of the world. However, the open gates of Teshuvah remind us that little repairs to a broken society matter just as little repairs to a damaged relationship. Repair need not be perfect in order to be profoundly valuable. In the vision offered by the RE, no one person could gather up all the sparks of the smashed divine vessels. However, the work that each person does matters. Make no mistake, the work of Teshuvah is exactly that, it's work. It's hard to own up to our mistakes, both as individuals and as a society. In fact, many contemporary rabbis have begun to think about Teshuvah, not only in the context of personal relationships, but also on the level of communities, cultures, and nations. At the forefront in a Jewish context is the author Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg. Her, her book on repentance and repair, Making Amends in an Unapologetic World, questions the prevailing American notion that forgiveness is always owed. Using the above-mentioned framework offered by Rambam, Rabbi Ruttenberg, she's a conservative rabbi um, in Chicago. She's been at a VBM before. She emphasizes the work by conservative capital C, not lowercase C, emphasizes the work of repair over the presumption of forgiveness, meaning she shifts the burden. Instead of the harmed party being obligated to work through their pain until they can find a way to forgive, it's up to the injuring party to work through their actions and return in the sense of teshuva to the person they believe they are. The shift in perspective she offers is so interesting in that it brings together teshuva and tikkun. 
Meaning when we apply the concept of repair, not just to our personal relationships, but to some of the most relevant and painful societal issues of our age, systematic racism and the legacy of slavery, slavery, gendered violence, Native American land rights, climate justice, etc., we can begin to imagine ways for the whole societies to make amends to the groups that have been marginalized and oppressed. The repair of society is possible, but only if those who have benefited from systematic injustices are willing to put in the work. We can see how a teshuva-centered model of justice is an alternative, not just to mass incarceration, also at the other end of the spectrum to the cancel culture approach of writing people off as irredeemable. You're out. To be clear, I do think there's a tremendous value in organizing that that responsibly withdraws support for public figures as a movement towards accountability. However, I also think that any social justice movement, for example, needs to find meaningful ways to reintegrate community members who have done wrong, knowingly knowingly or unknowingly, back into the community. A more meaningful approach is advocated by Professor Loretta J. Ross at Smith College who has popularized a powerful alternative, calling people in instead of calling them out, right? I don't know if she was the first to say this, but she was articulate in her version of it. As opposed to the public shaming of calling out, calling someone in involves a conversation. Such conversations is what is required, in the words of Professor Ross, to create a culture of compassion. I would call such a culture a tuva based culture. The possibility of repair in our relationships and in our world are part of a larger theological outlook in which repairing our connection to the divine, returning to God, is always possible. In fact, that God created humanity is in itself a vote of confidence in repair. We were given an imperfect world and tasked through our covenantal partnership with God to bring repair to this world. This is the wisdom that fuels generations of changemakers from the Lurianic Kabbalists of centuries past to the social action workers of today. Friends, to conclude here, some may feel that the world was created perfectly, that it was humans who have caused all the damage we are yet unable to undo. However, I would argue that the collective project of repair is actually at the core of the Jewish concept of creation itself. There's a powerful midrash that tells us that teshuva was created before the world. Seven things were created before the world was created. We read in Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer. They are the Torah, Gehenna, which means like hell, the Garden of Eden, the throne of glory, the temple, repentance, teshuva, and the name of the Messiah. Okay, each of those are worth unpacking, even though we're focusing on one of the seven. What an incredible concept this is that even before the world was created, promise of repair was created. I'm reminded of a popular saying in the techie world, if we have any techies here, is it a feature or a bug? Is it a feature or a bug? A bug is a problem. A feature is a benefit. What if we thought about the imperfections of our society and of our relationships, not as bugs, but as features? God did not give us a perfect world that we broke. No, God gave us a broken world that we might consistently enact repair together, bringing us closer to one another, to our mission, and to the divine. I would love to. uh, I would love to open the conversation. Thank you for um, for being in this. Hi, Matthew. Hi. Good morning. One of the problems with this is while we hope others will change and we can move forward is the tremendous commentary that thinking you're going to get a different result from the same actions multiple times is a form of what stupidity arrogance etc it's how often when you deal especially on the personal level will you be not only disappointed but upset by the actions of someone close to you you have to hold out that hope but you have to be guarded at the same time. And I'm not sure how to address that within the framework you beautifully laid out. Yeah, I'm so glad you flagged that because what I want to be clear that I'm not um, suggesting to us is some kind of naive version that um, everything is immediately repairable. 
that um um, and that any of this is simple or immediate, or that there are not real dangers in the world, um, or that we should remain in deep relationship with people who, as you said so well, Matthew, consistently hurt us. Um, I think there's, a, I there's think, a quote from something on uh, This American Life last week, and I've got to find it here. Mm -hmm. that, okay. And it was the shock of realizing you were unprepared for what has already happened and is happening again. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And it had to do with a Russian journalist living in Ukraine and then the West who was poisoned. They tried to kill her and she just couldn't accept. She knew these things were happening, but she couldn't accept it was happening to her. I think it's a wonderful note about repair and repentance that it happens again and again and how do you not be Pollyannish or more importantly how do you not hope the family member is going to change right right and so I think if folks know me you know that I don't believe in absolute values I believe in the tension between competing values yeah. and I think very much here I think that the dynamic is how do we balance being cautious in the world while being hopeful? And I think if we find ourselves only on one end of that spectrum, how do we balance it? Right? That um, people will not only get hurt, but uh, enable other people to get hurt if they're overly hopeful about the human condition, naive about the human condition. And people are going to hurt others and enable others to get hurt if they're overly cautious that people are not evolving and changing. Now, this is a unique time for us as American Jews, because any of you who lived through the second half of the 20th century truly lived through the golden age of Jewish history. The golden age. You had it better than Jews have ever had in the history of the world, right? Um, in terms of um, unprecedented acceptance in American life, um, and the celebration of, of, of Jewish society in American life, the thriving of and building of Israel, unlike ever before. And um, on every facet, it was never better for the Jews than in the second half of the 20th century. And now, when we see some of that starting to crumble, that, um, that the Zionist enterprise as it was dreamed, and part of that dream was, oh my gosh, we're going to have a state and the world is going to love us because we're now going to show the world what uh, how well a state can be run. We're going to show the world what it looks like when the Jews have power we never had before. And it turns out the world is not so enthralled with Jewish power. Um, maybe in some cases justifiably, certainly in other cases not justifiably. And it turns out that, um, that American uh, Jewish acceptance is is being you know called into question in um, both by the left that doesn't view Jews as adequate minorities in many ways and by the right which doesn't view the Jews as part of the white establishment in many ways and um, and so those who say up oh, like oh we had all this great repair all this great progress is the world against us again actually I'm not so sure that those changes that happened in the second half of the 20th century were anything more than superficial. And so, yes, so I think Matthew raises a great point here of how do we, on a societal level, on a on an interpersonal level, um, believe in repair while also kind of guarding ourselves from people who just seem to be incredibly unreflective, incredibly uninterested in their own growth or in making amends. And what do we do? We say, geez, I really want a relationship with my sister. Like, I really want one. But she... I've given her a hundred chances over 30 years and she's just not interested, you know, or like I have this cousin and yeah, they live down the block, but like they just, um, they're just not a decent person, you know? And I, so what do you do? Okay. Yes. Over to you. I, uh, your, your, your name is not up there. iPad 38. Uh, maybe that's you? me. Could that be me? David Newman. <laughs> I've got to change oh, yes. my Hi, name. David Newman. Thank you. Hi. Um, yes. Oh, thank you. This is such a great topic. And, uh, I love when you say the Rambam says that number two, uh, do all in our power to right the wrong in the eyes of the person that we don't have to wait around for someone to be, forgive us, but we can jump in and do whatever we can to make things right. Mm. I just think that is just a, a beautiful concept because uh, it is hard to creatively figure out, you know, uh, how to make things right. Um, but 
uh, it's it's in our power. Thank you, David, for sharing that. I think that's very well said. Yeah, we oftentimes, to our own fault, we are just wait for a few months, a few years, a few decades for that person to reach out to us thinking it's on them. And it may be deeply in our benefit to make that pathway easier for them to enter. Yes, Gary and then Cindy. Hey, everyone. Uh, I, I, I want to take off where Matthew uh, started there. Uh, I, I think we've got to be totally naive to think that uh, everybody's good and everybody will be placed in somewhere heal, heal the world. Uh, I mean, heal themselves. Uh, but I, I, I look at it as 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 two segments: uh, individual healing or tikkun, and and societal uh, tikkun uh, or healing, uh, and making making uh, it a, uh, an attempt to make it a better world. And, and how we work on a, on a day to day basis, uh, uh, you know, talking to talk and walking to walk, or are, are is it always been an important thing to me how you treat people uh how you recognize people how you though i may not have been personally involved or my family evolved in some racist act or in uh in inequality uh i don't have to be that way i mean i treat all people as equal and 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 that that that's a personal issue or family or, or what have you, and then there's to me there's there's social issues where uh, I may have little impact as an individual, but can make a larger impact uh, belonging to things like VBM or getting involved in in other organizations that fight for the rights of those that are not uh, equal uh, uh, in the world. So I I kind of see it as as two separate uh two separate issues and then uh you know on on a personal level somebody told me years and years ago a, a friend that if you have no expectations on other people then you'll never get hurt uh and so to go to what matthew is i uh to say that you know you 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 get that's what i want to use you you become uh you know unrealistic that uh that you 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 your cousin for 30 times, as you mentioned, just doesn't want to be involved. Uh, but but continuing to do what you need to do to make that relationship is is up to you, not 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 up not up not up to them. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Great, great. Thank you so much. And I'll I'll, I'll leave much of what you shared for, for others to engage with. Uh, but thank you for those thoughtful reflections, Gary. And just to just to take it you know, um, one level further on how deep I think this idea is of redeemability, um, and yet how different that can look for different people. Let's think. Let's look at the eschatological issue of the afterlife. Where it's well known that in Christian thought, it's binary, right? In traditional Christian thought, there's heaven and there's hell, right? And the good folks are going to go up there, and the bad folks are going to go down there, and boom, it's done, right? But in the most common form of Jewish traditional approach to afterlife, there's a notion of Gehenna. And Gehenna is not a, an eternal damnation. Gehenna is a cleansing purgatory, which is to say that soul that got really dirty needs to be cleaned off for a, for, for a year. And then that soul has been beautified to return. What an interesting kind of theological concept that there's no one who, even the worst of the worst, who would just be eternally damned, but would rather need a cleansing. Now, cleansing might look different for everyone. Some Somebody might need a little toothbrush to kind of get a little stain off, right? Someone might need a blowtorch, and someone might need a bonfire, right? Um, so the, that cleansing process of uh, purgatory might look very different. And so to, so to here, we may have estrangements, which are pretty petty. Right. There's actually a person who reached out to me just this last week. We had a little quibble about a year ago. It was pretty small, but it kind of put the relationship on pause. And all it took was his email to be like, hey, remember that thing last year? Like, let's just move past. And I'm like, yeah, you're totally right. And it was like such a small thing. So easy to fix. And there's that. And then there's so many other layers of, of what it takes. And sometimes I think we're tempted to move towards the sense of irredeemability because it lets us off the hook. We don't have to do the work um, that's involved. And other times um, it's it's being fairly cautious. And, and so I appreciate that point. Yes. Hi, Cindy. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, am I? Let me unmute. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're there. Uh, you're there, Cindy. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, just. Are you in, in Phoenix or Wisconsin? Right now, I'm in Wisconsin. Okay. Good. I'll be back, I'll be back on Monday. Um, okay, so just to kind of compare cultures, I, uh, I'm in a film class and we watched a fascinating movie this week called Secret Sunshine. It's a Korean movie. And in this movie, this woman, um, her son is abducted and killed and they find the killer. And as part of her grief process, she turns to a Christian faith and she decides she's going to go to the prison and for, forgive the murderer. This is part of her grieving process. And she gets to the gets to the prison and the gentleman, before she can say anything, talks about how he has been born again. He has been forgiven by God and he's he shows no remorse and it just destroyed her. She never got any kind of apology. You know, and it's just such a totally opposite kind of um, relationship, you know. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's not only in that space. I think there's a strand of that happening in self-help culture today, too, which views um, the, the wellness of the self as primary without any ethical implications. Mm -hmm. That sense of like, I'm going to do my therapy. I'm going to do my healing from whatever was in my life and actually doesn't doesn't incorporate a notion of responsibility into that. And I think that this is becoming more and more pervasive, this kind of obsession with self-healing as opposed to the kind of this collective, this collective process. And I think we see that in religious traditions and we see that in secular society as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm so glad you shared that. And, um, and, and I think that that's one of the, the negative sides of kind of the, the the notion of divine love those who teach kind of god loves you god loves you always and just return to god and that's really all you need um as opposed to a notion of divine love which includes responsibility like parent loves a child so you make them do things they don't want to do yeah so cindy thank you for sharing that and and, yep. and sounds like a, a film worth checking out hi judy i think we have a community uh ethic of being a bit um OCD, because we're told to admonish other Jews. We're supposed to make sure that when we read Torah, everything is absolutely perfect. We're supposed to follow things strictly and be um, mindful of a whole bunch of things. But then in relationships, if you take that hall monitor or, or quality control expert approach to other people, you, you end up wanting to micromanage them and wanting to uh, make their make them conform to something, some kind of expectation or standards or some imposed notion of how they should behave. Whereas I think the better approach is one that was recommended to Ruth Bader Ginsburg's mother-in-law on the eve of her marriage, which was it helps sometimes to be a little deaf. So I think that the, the stance of being accepting and forgiving is hard when you're supposed to be self-critical and you know, it's intention. Like you say, there are a lot of things going on there, but uh, if we, if we take the stance that reserving the expectations on upon ourselves and acceptance upon others, it's going to be a whole lot easier to get along with other people in life. So well said. So well said, Judy. And um, I really don't have much to add to that, aside from just uh, affirming that it resonates for me as well. And this takes a lot of work. It really takes a lot of work to reflect on how we view others critically and how we can be a little bit more gentle at times and how that's related and connected to how we were raised as children and how we continue to view ourselves and how whatever bar we set for ourselves, sometimes hypocritically, we hold ourselves to a low bar and other people to a high bar, or we hold ourselves to a high bar and thus holding other people to the same bar and and, and various other formulations. So thank you for that. Uh, more to say, but yes, Shmuley, over to you. Shmuley. Yes, Judy, yes, please. I think if, we, if you live your life with the notion of, I, I don't know where it comes from in the Talmud, but the idea is that you're supposed to greet other people before they have a chance to greet you. Yes, right. 
So I think that if you take that attitude, and I think Steve Chauvin lives like this, but he's he's not paying attention. Um, no, you pay attention. You, he's there. <laughs> if you're the first to greet that person, if you, if you're the first to affirm the beauty of the day, it makes it harder for that other person to have a hostile attitude too. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, very well said. Okay, good. Thank you, Reb Neal. I, I think your hand went up a second ago. Uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm I almost don't want to take time because I, I love just listening to this. Um, but it was somebody I forgot who made the comment a minute ago. But my brain went to like this priest and prophet model, right? So we have this idealized religion where it's it's it stresses us out that we can't hit those marks, right? But then we have the 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 religion, the folk religion, uh, which is the way in which we do it, right? We know what the what the ask is, but this is how we are going to engage, and we we often fall short of that mark. But of course, the striving is the holy part. Um, Teshuva is, is very complicated and very messy and um, with all the human variables that are involved with it. So I, I don't like putting like absolutes on it. I, I get the ideal and I get the holiness that comes from mm -hmm. engaging. Uh, but sometimes I'm just as happy with the folk version of it, you know, the messiness. Yes, that's awesome. I love that. Thinking about this whole concept through the lens of the ideal and through the reality. And I think contrasting that Judaism has both a prophetic tradition and a sage tradition. And the prophetic tradition has all these ideals, stand for justice all the time, right? I never be silent, right? I'm thinking about the Eli Wiesel voice. So I always pick a side, no neutrality. Like everything is kind of a little bit um, black and white, a little bit extreme, a little bit kind of you have to be a rabble rouser at all times to stand for truth and justice. And there's a place for that. And I'm glad that's a part of our tradition. And then there's our rabbinic side, which is only wants moderation and balance and argumentation and no absolutes and wants us to be in the messiness of it. And how do we embrace that, too, that there's this great ideal of tikkun and teshuva out there, and yet we have to come out of the sky right? Um, and then exist in this messy reality of making each case on its own, um, each person on their own and each situation on its own and wrestle through that. And I think that, um, um, I think so, it's worth asking ourselves, which one do we struggle more with? In, living in the gray, messy space or, or holding on to the ideal? And I think I know folks who kind of tend towards one or the other. Those who live in the ideal are often frustrated in the world because the world looks nothing like the ideal. Um, and those who live in the messiness, frustrated by what appears to be the naivete of those who are dreamers of the ideal. Yes, okay. Um, yes, before we open up for folks who have spoken, I just want to see if either Colleen or Gary Gartsman or Steve Chauvin or Francine or Barb or Alex or Eddie or Aglaia want to weigh in at all. Okay, hey, Steve. Hey, uh, thank you very much. And I, I'm, as usual, loved every bit of this uh, discussion. Uh, first, a word from your sponsor. I am not naive about the world condition, but I think I'd really be remiss in not acknowledging some of the great things that happen every single day. And I might, I might be talking about it on too low a level because I can't generalize about a lot of things. Some of the irresolvable conflicts that I've gotten into have been age related. I, as an older person, 80 plus, see things differently or can tolerate things differently than a younger person. Uh, I, who live in a warm climate, can see things or feel things differently than other people. So it might be trying to narrow the playing field a little bit and trying to, uh, to cooning and uh, resolving world conflicts rather than trying to reach out uh, to every sphere. Um, one other thing, and that this is not related, uh, is it incumbent on the injured to seek redress given the fact that the other might not even be knowing that he or she hurt the person? And again, to me, it's it happens a lot in my age and somewhat in my politics, um, and I can't change either of them. 
Um, so before we get to your first point, what I I, I want to make sure I understood your second one, Steve. Um, I, what I understood your second one to be is when someone is unaware that they may have caused harm, um, it, to what extent should we bring that to their awareness? Did I hear that correctly or no? No, I was thinking of the injured person. Okay. And, and, and seeing that the injurer might not be aware. Right. But still, you're hurt. You want to say something and, and, and right. hopefully... Right push things along that the, that the it, whether or not the injured should bring awareness to the injurer of, of what is occurring yeah. is that what you're saying yeah mm -hmm. right yes yeah that is a um that is a remarkable question and on the one hand we have this idea we've been talking about here around the need to to create repair psychologically monetarily so socially and it feels like there's an imperative to approach them to let them know on the other hand there's a whole talmudic ethic around um not being slighted easily that the things that have slighted us we should learn how to let go of and these seem to be contradictory ethics one which seeks seems to emphasize that we should bring it up because we can't get through get through it unless we bring it up. And the other one, which seems to emphasize that um, we should let things go. Um, that if 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 everything, every way we had slighted someone else was brought to our attention, it'd be overwhelming. And so too for others as well. And so that's an interesting tension. And getting into the specifics of that could be interesting, Steve. Um uh, in our next uh, our next coffee together to think about you know because it, it's always more interesting case by case but it's a great question you're raising and to your first point around age the only counter argument I would give although I I completely agree that I have uh, been amazed by people who um, who are seniors and their ability to look beyond uh, to look beyond the petty and be able to move into that realm of forgiveness. Um, it's also true that watching young children, I see them within 10 seconds go from, I hate you, I'll never be your friend again, to 10 seconds later saying, will you be my BFF? Right? And it's a remarkable thing to watch. Like, you're a butthead. Like, that's the phrase that's pretty common. One of the phrases, you're a butthead. Will you be my best friend forever? Will you, will, you, will you sleep over? And it's a remarkable thing to watch young children see how they will um so quickly move past these things um and yet um and yet also yeah later in life as well so there's a lot of wisdom to look in lots of directions yes eddie yeah um i i find your classes always so inspirational and i i find that the topics are on point um specifically for me recently uh, one of my favorite comic book writers uh unfortunately took his own life and he did this uh, based off of um, cancel culture. Um, he he had done some inappropriate things, but um, he was never brought to even give the ability to ask for forgiveness or even begin the process of chuba. And I think that we are getting closer and closer to an absolutist um, community that does not provide pathways for chuba. I know that the person I am today is not the person I was yesterday, nor is it the person I was years ago. I work at a social justice organization that gets to save lives and enrich Torah every single day, but that's not who I was in high school, nor was that the person I was in college. And I, I think that it's a scary time for us to to sustain the idea of just simply being in a call-out cancel culture. Uh, and we're seeing that today, unfortunately, as well with what's happening in, in Israel, um, where folks are almost demonizing people to the point where they have to um, feel like there is no out. And it's getting really scary. And it's it's making people feel like they're not enough when we make simple mistakes. And I feel like that is a critical error in our communities to uh, shame people to the point that they feel they are not in love. And unfortunately, it takes um, it takes people's lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eddie, share, thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry for your loss of this um, of this influential person in your life. I, I was also reading about this person yesterday, and um, and reading the post, the final post they made, and um, it was just uh, moving and troubling and and sad and infuriating, and and um, and that's how high the stakes are. 
with these issues. When we talk about the great 10 great Jewish ideas, we're not talking like, oh, isn't matzo ball soup good? Right? Isn't this Yiddish joke funny? Right? Nothing wrong with that stuff. Right? We're talking about ideas that really matter and are worth fighting for in the world. And the idea that people should not be easily discarded right, socially and, um, um, and uh, familial, in the familial setting and the like is such a big idea. And of course, as we've said, there's cautions around this, but the stakes are so high for people who have been isolated, people who have been hurt on so many levels. And as always, the class is only the starting point. Um, I hope we'll all do spend some reflective time on after everything matters, thinking about um, things in our life that we might add more significance to that may have fallen off. And in a session like today, thinking about some of the areas where we're pursuing teshuva and tikkun in our own life, not in a way that's heavy and oppressive, but in a way that's exciting. But right, part of being alive is being a part of, a, of an ongoing growth process, being a part of a changing world and a changing self. And to think in a way that is exciting, even though there's a level of challenge to it, of how we can add more of that light and how we can see that in our own lives that that the, that the candle is still is still lit. So Eddie, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. David, you had uh, raised your hand a moment ago. Do you want to come back in? Yeah, our, my rabbi in St. Louis uh, uh, calls it missing the mark, uh, teshuva. And uh, getting back to what Judy was saying about the, the judgy attitude, sometimes, you know, with it defined as repentance, there's that heavy judginess. But if you... If you, I'm kind of a Buju, Buddhism, Judaism, kind of meshing the two a little bit, but if daily I try to cultivate um, forgiveness, you know, letting go, I mean, don't getting so upset about the minor things because life is too precious and too short. And if you become more forgiving each day, forgiving the world, forgiving God for not making it more easy for us, um, then you uh, strengthen those forgiveness, you know, brain cells or whatever. And uh, so I, I kind of see it that way, that forgiveness is the other side of the coin from gratitude. Thank you for this day. Mm -hmm. And um, I forgive the imperfections, even though I'm going to try to work hard at them. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that insight. You know, um, one of the things I read yesterday was around um, about a spiritual leader that was approached by their student, and was um, and as the spiritual leader was approaching the end of their life, the student said, "What will you be thinking about? What will you be thinking about when you're dying?" And the spiritual leader said, "I'm going to think about all the other people dying at the same moment, and sending wishes to them um, that they are not suffering." And I thought about that. That in our own um, anxiety, when we're anxious, one of the spiritual practices we might do is think about all the other people in the world who are anxious at that moment and send them words of prayer um, and, and and wishes. If we, if we, um, I was saying, I was saying this to my seven-year-old daughter when she skinned her knee last night. Um, I have one child who has a very high tolerance to pain, like his ear could like have fallen off and he's, he's laughing. And then I've got her and literally the smallest thing is like the world is ending right now. And so uh, I tried this approach and I said, you know, let's think right now, but every seven year old girl in the world who, who right now is crying and let's say a prayer to them that they, that, that they feel better. And this actually worked pretty well for her because she was able to come out of her own skinned knee a little bit and feel a, so a global solidarity with people who were experiencing something different. All these other seven-year-old girls in Indonesia and in Canada and in Iceland. Are there girls in Iceland? <laughs> and, um, and able to send wishes to them um, around their healing. Maybe, maybe they have they have ice burn over there instead of a skin knee. I don't know what they got. But in any case, so too, going along with what you're saying here, that we're a part of a global spiritual revolution of forgiving and of healing and seeing all these things not as microcosms but as part of a as kind of a global phenomenon right um it might be something enriching okay time for one more person someone maybe who didn't weigh in yet if they want to hop in here at all okay yes hi uh, uh Gary Friedler. oh i just want to end with uh 
I think some of what you're speaking about, we've become such a, a self uh, me oriented world where everybody hurts me and, 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 you know, we all know that what's going on. So, uh, you know, part of, of, of what I think David said is that, you know, maybe we should just forgive people. Uh, if you're hurt, uh, uh, let it go. Uh, we're, we're so, uh, so worried about being hurt. Uh, if we just let it go and be happy, we got up the next morning, it's a new day, uh, rather than hanging on to, I think last week you said the book, uh, forget the little stuff <laughs> and, and, and let it go because it, it just becomes a cumulative and you're mad at the world and you're mad at everybody and everybody's hurting you. Don't be so sensitive, uh, in your mind, let, just let it go, forgive them because whatever reason you want to give that they just didn't know better and go have a good day. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Gary. You know, and we should see how the media and the political discourse is feeding into that anger that these groups of people are perpetually the oppressed. These groups of people are perpetually the oppressors. Right. Or that you are a victim and you have the right to be mad. Right. Reaffirming in um, in unchangeable victim status. Right. And these things that work really well if you're trying to get votes. Right. Um, and to feed into. Right. And and to be sure, it happens on all ends. It happens on all ends of the spectrum, right? That that if you're, um, if, if you're a white farmer in America, you're the victim. You've been robbed of of the America we once had, right? Or or on the other end, that you're a minority. You're an inevitable victim as a minority in this country, right? Um, and so um, we have to see how these narratives are fueling this sense that the that there's something unforgivable and that i am fundamentally owed something right and that i am a victim and what that does is um, it really harms relationships and the ability to see people as people in themselves so thank you all this is heavy stuff and i hope it's something that we can celebrate as part of our tradition that we don't just say judaism is fun and games we dance around and uh <laughs> have a good time we should do that too of course um, but we also like reflect deeply on brokenness and on healing and how each of us is a part of that on a small level and on a cosmic level. Have a beautiful day.